You must have a, a forgiving wife then. I'm, I'm assuming if, you're, if your honeymoon was at, you know, the Fiesta Bowl, you never get to forget a birthday or anything like, or an anniversary or anything, right? Mike, think of it. We, we had the horseback riding, we had the tours, we had dinners. Didn't cost me a dime. <laughs> That was Dave Wanset, and this is On the Bench with Mike Hall. That's me. Good old Wani. He's an example of a tangentially related Big Ten person we want on this podcast. Never played in the conference, never coached in it, but he has been with our network and Fox for years covering the league, and he's had a fascinating life. A three-year starter and team captain and offensive line for Pittsburgh, Wanset was selected by the Packers in the 1974 NFL Draft. He went on to be an assistant coach at places like Oklahoma State, USC, Miami. He had great success in college and the pros as Jimmy Johnson's defensive coordinator. They won Super Bowl 27, thanks in large part to Dave's defense with the Cowboys. It was time for him to be a head coach, so he replaced Mike Ditka with the Chicago Bears. He remains to this day the last Bears head coach to win a road playoff game. In 1999, he became the Dolphins defensive coordinator, again under Jimmy. Then he replaced Jimmy as the head coach the next year. And Dave still is today second most all time on head coaching wins in Miami Dolphins history. He went back to college coaches alma mater Pitt from 05 to 2010, and he joined Fox Sports and us back in 2014. And now all that is good and well, and now you know his history. But truthfully, the reason I'm having him on this week is well, he interrupted last week's podcast at the end with Roosevelt Colvin. So I felt I ought to start this podcast by asking him, did he know we were recording when he barged in? No, I don't read signs. So I just uh, kind of a little bit of the bull in a uh, China clause, as they said. What, what do you mean you don't read signs? I stopped in to say hi. I'm not going to walk by your office. You were behind your desk. You know, I mean, I walk in to say hi. I haven't seen you. I haven't done any shows with you this year. We used I know you're stuff. avoiding me. No, geez, I don't. I just show up here. I'm, the, to... I'm the bottom guy in the totem pole. I don't <laughs> check who, who I'm on shows with. Maybe you're down there with me. Do you ever think of that? That's true. That's why we're not doing it. You're going this way. I'm going this way. I don't know. That's probably true. You know, we we have, I've been lucky enough to do shows with you for a few years. And there's a couple things that I love that I would have never guessed about you until I worked with you. One of them, you love the word bang. I do. Uh, yeah, I got that when I was coaching. Actually, it was the um, Frank Signetti, who was my offensive coordinator at the University of Pittsburgh, who's now the offensive coordinator at Boston College. His brother, is the head coach at James Madison. And his father was a famous uh, coach in Pennsylvania. And he was at West Virginia, Frank Signetti Sr. So, and Frank, whenever we would complete a big pass, he would turn and he would kind of go bang, you know, to the offensive players. Well, it became, it got contagious. The next thing you know, I'm sitting there and we complete a long one. He looks at me, I said, I know, bang, you know. I used it a couple of times on the Fox shows and I don't know. It's um, that's where it all started though. Back in Pittsburgh. Like we'll we didn't, many, we didn't have many bangs. So whenever we banged them in Pittsburgh, we, uh, we banged them big throwing the ball. But like, even in TV, like we'll finish a good segment and then we'll go off the air and you'll just look and go bang. Right. Or like I sent you a picture when my child was born and you wrote back the bang emoji. <laughs> My, I'm going to give you a story. My grandsons, I've got six of them, or six, five grandsons, one granddaughter. But my grandsons now are getting old enough. They're playing sports. Got one group in Wilmette, one out west. And when I'm around the city, or the other day, we're up there and I'm taking one. We're going to go get McDonald's or ice cream or something. And they're in the car and the guy driving the, uh, you know, the FedEx truck pulls up beside me. We're kind of passing on the street. He puts his window down. He says, coach. I said, what's up? Go Bears or something. And <laughs> I pulled away. And my grandsons, they're six years old. They'll look at me. They'll say, pap, bang. <laughs> <laughs> so they, 
They do it now. I don't know. You've passed it on. The other thing that I love is you will call anyone, whether it's a former coach or someone who's never coached or a studio anchor or a producer or a cameraman, you will call them coach. You'll say, coach, what are we doing today? Coach, what's in the rundown? I was a football coach for 40 years and the people that I've <laughs> dealt with and staffed me, you know, it's, and, and that, it's kind of sad because a lot of people, I'll be going to a, uh, an appointment or a doctor's appointment or picking up an order and people call me coach for some reason. Yeah. So I, you know, again, that's, I'm just a creature of habit, I guess. I don't know. So I, um, I have done that. If I get excited, if I get excited, that's, that's what comes out of my mouth. You gave me once one of my favorite quotes every once in a while, someone that I'll work with says something that's so funny that I'll write it down. Like Sean Moritz once said, his coach told him, don't think it only hurts the team. And so I wrote that down and that's up on my wall. You once said to me, Mike, I'm half sick being a coach. <laughs> it works. Well, with the hours and the, the stupid stuff and uh, everything that goes into it, if you didn't love what you were doing and if you didn't do it because you felt like you were making a difference, it, it, it would make no sense, particularly when you start off. You know, I do some work for the NFL right now and they have seminars. They're trying to bring along the youngest coaches in the NFL. Okay. So we have a seminar and they bring somebody in from management and somebody in from scouting and, and I'll go and there's about uh, maybe 50, 60 of the youngest, just starting out coaches. And I asked them a question. I said, tell me why you want to be a coach. Half these guys had played in the NFL. And I'm just waiting for one guy to say, oh, for the fame or for the money. I said, tell me why. You know what probably 95% of them say, and it's the right answer. I want to be a coach because when I was in ninth grade or eighth grade or high school or college, a coach did something, said something, made a difference in my life that I'm here today and I want to, I want to have that same impact. And that's the right reason. You don't get into coaching for money. You don't get into coaching for the fame because when you start off, it's, it's, you know, it's better now, obviously than it ever been, but uh, back in my days, my wife was making more money than me and I was working, you know, three times the hours. It was, right. it was, it was sick. <laughs> Stupid. Half sick. Yeah. When did you, like, you were a good player. You, you were a legit, you were drafted by the NFL. You had some real talent. So when did you know you, you know, want to make coaching? You, know you know how good a player I was? You were drafted. My, my junior year, wait, listen to me. My junior year at Pitt, we ran for, our leading running back ran for about 400 yards. <laughs> Next year, our running back ran for 1,560 yards. Tony Dorsett. <laughs> okay? And everybody said, boy, what happened? And I said, it's real simple. I did not block anybody any different <laughs> when we ran for 1,500 yards as we did for 400, okay? Yeah. But it was the back. So I'm halfway in jet, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it, the, I had some good players. But when did you, when did you know you wanted to be a coach? Oh, I, you know, I was an education major at Pitt. So I was, Coach Majors was my coach. And he offered me a graduate assistant position because he knew that I, I told him, you know, afterwards I was his first captain at Pitt. And, you know, so we had a great relationship and he, what do you want to do? And I said, well, when I got back from Green Bay, I was doing rehab. And he said, if you want, I got a, a graduate assistant position, but I got to know in the next month or two. So I took the job. And at the same time, I actually took the first part of, uh, I was going to be an FBI agent or a coach. And I went through the first part of the FBI qualification stuff, test, so forth, interview. So I was going down that path and I was, you know, being a graduate coach. And then lo and behold, we win the national championship 
Coach Majors goes to Tennessee. Jimmy Johnson joins the staff at Pitt as our assistant head coach. Jackie Sherrill was the head coach. Jackie offered me a full-time job. So when that happened, I kind of put the FBI on the back burner. Now I'm full-time. I'm making a few bucks. And don't you know, two years later, Jimmy Johnson and I get done playing some racquetball at the Y in Pittsburgh. We go across the street to Tambellini's restaurant. We're having a few beers. And he said, how'd you like to come to Oklahoma State with me? <laughs> he said, I'm, I'm going to get this job. He says, my roommate in college knows a lot of people down there. I said, who's your roommate in college? He said, Jerry Jones. <laughs> he says, he is wealthy. He's down in Arkansas. He's in the oil business, the gas business. He knows a lot of people at Oklahoma State. I think I'm going to get this job. And the rest is history. That's wild. You were this close to being an FBI agent, and then the story ends with you and Jimmy Johnson starting off at Oklahoma State. True. True story. Okay, so... When do you remember the first time you met Jimmy? We used to take our recruits to a place in Pittsburgh called the Black Angus. It was a steakhouse, local place. And uh, I was taking some recruits down there, and Jackie announced that he just hired Jimmy from Arkansas. And Jimmy came in, and, and so that was the first time we met at this dinner function. Yeah. Did and we just clicked. We just hit it off. I mean, I, I don't know how. I mean, to this day, we we work, you know, for Fox. We have coffee every – you you were talking about stupid, sick. We meet at 4 o'clock every Sunday morning in the green room for coffee, you know. <laughs> and uh, and we talk about all the college games. Yeah. So what happened the day before, and, and then we uh, – uh, and then we – talk about what we're going to do. I'm on the hour show on Fox. Tune in, let, viewer, 11 <laughs> o'clock Eastern time on Fox. You'll see. <laughs> and our show runs in. It's a two-hour pregame. We run right into their show. Right. Were you were you and Jimmy close enough? Like, were you at each other's weddings? No. Oh, no, 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 no. Jimmy, heck, I, I had, when I met Jimmy, I had, I was already married, had a child, and Jimmy got his boys were 10 years old, you know? No. Gotcha. Someone told me you had a wedding story related to Jimmy. Sounds like that. Person. Oh, yeah, I do. I do. I was, I was the best man at his wedding. Oh yeah, I guess I was. <laughs> no, second one. When we first met, you know, he was married and uh, kids and all that stuff. And then he, he gets divorced and we're at the university of Miami. And, uh, I had just left the Bears. So I'm down there at Miami with him as the assistant head coach. And, and, and we kind of had a plan. If we could win, you know, this would be a great opportunity to possibly take an over on, on and on. So he had a, uh, a clear blue sky. He decided to have a staff party at his house. He lives down in the Keys, Island Murata, uh, Marker 88, Jimmy's place. So <laughs> We, he invites the whole organization. I'm talking about the video guys, the salary cap guys, everybody's down there. And um, so he brings in a little three piece band and they're playing music and everybody's having a hell of a time. We're having, it's great, a lot of fun. And all of a sudden I'm in the pool and our head guy of security, who was there walking, you know, keeping things organized, he comes out to the pool and he says, Dave, Dave, come here. Well, I was kind of always Jimmy's troubleshooter. So the minute he says, I got to see me at a party, my first reaction is, this isn't good. You know, something went wrong. Uh, we're going to have to be dealing with something here. So we go in, he says, follow me. Now, I just got out of the pool. So I'm soaking wet. I'm trying to dry off. He says, we got to go upstairs. Jimmy wants to see you. So I said, oh, boy, this is, here we go. So I walk upstairs and Jimmy's standing there in his bathing suit, dripping wet. He's got a Heineken in one hand and a dog in the other hand. <laughs> and, and Rhonda, his wife, future wife, girlfriend, standing next to him and her friend, Mary, her best friend. And Jimmy says, hey, I'm going to get married. And our security guy's a justice and a peace. 
Stu Weinstein. He's going to do it, and you be the best man. She's going to be the whatever lady, you know, of honor, and uh, here we go. So we're standing there dripping wet. Jimmy's got his dog under one arm and a Heineken in the other, and uh, I'm holding, and here we go. So then we walk down, and Jimmy walks out, and he says, cut the music. And they stop the music, and he says, hey, let me introduce you to the new Mrs. Jimmy Johnson. And they both jump in the pool. Here we go. <laughs> so then, <laughs> so then, you know, Jimmy's up at 2.30 or 3 every morning. He's on the water before the sun comes up on his boat. Okay, that's how he operates. So he doesn't stay up real late. So now it's about nine, uh, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock. And there's still people partying. He calls me aside. He says, hey, when are these people going to get out of here? And I said, well, as long as the, the booze is going and the lights are on and the music's playing, they're going to stay. He says, well, I can solve that real quick. So he goes over and he just, now Jan and I, we were staying with him. It is right there. So we were spending a night. Everybody else drove down. So he goes over and just yanks the cord. Complete darkness around his pole. And he goes in his house. So everybody stand there to me. What's up? I said, hey, party's over, folks. Thanks for coming. See you tomorrow at the office. <laughs> Quick way to do it. Yeah. That was the wedding. That was the wedding. <laughs> uh, what about you? Where was your honeymoon? At the Fiesta Bowl. <laughs> we, played, we played Penn State my senior year. I got married the next week. Practiced, went on a weekend to the Marriott out in Pittsburgh. Monday, I had practice. I think it was Friday. We got on a plane and we flew. We were playing Arizona State in the Fiesta Bowl. And uh, Coach Majors let me take my wife. We played, we stayed, I think, at the Camelback Inn, real nice place out there. So my honeymoon literally was the Fiesta Bowl. It's pretty romantic. Yeah, we played played at Arizona State. Frank Cush was the coach. I'm going to throw a few names at you. Danny White okay. was the quarterback. Okay. Bob, Bru Bob Bruning was their linebacker. Woody Green was their running back. I mean, they were really talented. Good. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what that? You know what that held? That bowl game, that stadium, we had 35,000 people. That was maxed out. That's the size of Arizona State Stadium where the Fiesta Bowl was in 1974. How about that? Uh, well, you, you must have a, a forgiving wife then. I'm, I'm assuming if your if your honeymoon was at you know the Fiesta Bowl, you never get to forget a birthday or anything like or an anniversary or anything, right? Mike, think of it. We we had the horseback riding, we had the tours, we had dinners. Didn't cost me a dime. <laughs> right? Hey, it. Mike. Free flights, free room, meals, uh, events every night. Yeah. Pretty smart. Pretty smart. Next level stuff from you. I thought it all up. What uh so you you let's go back to your you're with Jimmy, you're at Oklahoma State, things are going well. Eventually he gets the job at Dallas. Did you ever think of not going with him and trying to take, you know, a head coaching job somewhere else? Or was it sort of like, no, this is working, let's go? No, I, I wanted to be in the NFL. I was actually working when he took the job at Dallas, not many people know this. I was actually working for the Miami Dolphins. I went up and interviewed for a job with the Pittsburgh Steelers. He had a linebacker, Coach Noel had a linebacker job. So I went up and spent the day with Chuck Noel. And he was talking to, I think, four people. And he asked me the last question. He said, is there anybody in the NFL that you're close to that I could call for a reference? I said, yeah, Marty Schottenheimer, because Marty was a pit man. He was the head coach at Cleveland. And I used to go up there in the summer to try to learn. And I said, Coach Shula at the Dolphins, because we were at the University of Miami, and so we would go to all their mini camps and all their training camps, again, trying to learn. So I go right to the Pittsburgh airport, no cell phones, put my quarter in, and I call Marty. And I call Coach Shula and said, hey, I just interviewed. I used you as a reference. I'd really like to get in the NFL. And if you can help me, I appreciate it. He said, no problem. Hang up. Three days later, maybe four days later, I don't hear anything from Pittsburgh. 
My phone rings at the University of Miami. Now, keep in mind, we were pretty good then on defense. You know, I don't – Yeah. Get, we gave up a touchdown a game. It was like the world was coming to an end, okay? <laughs> and and uh, so he calls me and said, did you hear from Steelers yet? I said, no. He says, what are you doing tonight? I said, nothing. You know, he says, why don't you drive up here? Let's talk. So I went up, sat down with Coach Shula, and Tom Albadotti was the defensive coordinator, and he offered me the linebacker job. Whoa. So I took it. I left Miami and went to the line to the Dolphins for six weeks, and then Jimmy called me, and he gets the Cowboy job, and then I went down there as defensive coordinator. I've always wondered this. Like, it seems okay in the coaching community that you can leave after six weeks. Like, it happens all the time. But I feel like other jobs, like people, would not be okay with that. Well, this was a big promotion, though. I went from linebackers. I mean, you know, I was. I, I had my first defensive meeting at the Dallas Cowboys. I had four, maybe five players that were older than I was. I mean, we were young. We were young. And so this was a great opportunity. And uh, so I, I couldn't pass it up. What did you find is the biggest difference coaching college versus coaching the NFL? All the, the you know what, the time, everybody says recruiting, but you're spending time on scouting, you know? I didn't find any difference time-wise. The hours, it, it's, it is what it is. I think the biggest thing was I loved college because you get these 18-year-old kids, and, man, you can make a difference in their lives on and off the field. I mean, I still get players from Pitt, the LaShawn McCoy. The guys call up after I left it, two or three years would call me and say, Coach, I just got that degree that we talked about. I got it in front of me. I mean, stuff like that. Where the NFL, it's business. You know, it's all about winning and contracts and money. Yeah. You you did have some great success uh, at the NFL, uh, especially when you were with Dallas. You mentioned your, your defense in Miami in college was great. Your defense at, at Dallas was incredible. You're in the Super Bowl. I think it was Super Bowl 27. And two things are fascinating to me as I was looking back on this. The halftime was Michael Jackson – and do you remember who flipped the coin? No. OJ. Of course. We were in the, Ro <laughs> we were in the Rose Bowl. Why not? No, it was a different time in 1993, man. How about that? Yeah. What is, what is it like as a coach at halftime of a Super Bowl when there's all this other stuff happening? Like, it's got to be different from any other halftime. Yeah. I mean... It's longer. That's the only difference. And, and as a coach, you have a routine. Like I would call, I did all my defensive calls from the press box my whole career. And I would have my, so I would get up there and I knew exactly when I would leave after warmups on the field, exactly who I was going to, where my book was, exactly who was taking me up to the press box. And when I got up there, I would put all my charts where I knew they were exactly and when I looked down and I would have one cigarette and I would uh, it'd be ready to go. Well, guess what? For the before the Super Bowl, we shake hands, I do my boom up there, put the stuff up, go out, I have my one cigarette, and all of a sudden I'm looking, I go back in, the teams aren't even on the field yet. And there was a delay because of the flyovers and everything. I was panicked. I was out of cigarettes. I had my mindset ready. And now my mind starts, you know, I'm saying I'm, I've already accepted the job with the Bears. God, but I haven't signed that contract. What happens if we get blown out today? Maybe they'll renege on the con. I mean, all this, I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm going crazy. It was the longest three minutes right. before we kicked off because I was out of my routine. I've been doing something every week, every week, the exact same way. So I didn't realize you had the Bears job before the Super Bowl. Yes. Oh, yeah. Jimmy wanted, didn't, Jimmy wanted to give me every opportunity. He was unbelievable. So I, I was interviewing for, with the Giants, all these teams. I had like four or five offers and get all the stuff done so that, boom, when it was over, and, and the Giants stepped up and offered me beforehand – and uh, and so the Bears did the same thing. Wow. What made you pick the Bears over the Giants then? 
I, I was just more comfortable with Chicago and the people and um, that's all. Yeah. When you got there, you had a quarterback on your roster named Jim Harbaugh. Yes. Did you, did you think back then he'd be a successful head coach? You know what? I thought he'd be a successful linebacker. Jim, Jim was the toughest guy. I mean, he was as competitive and tough a player. I just felt bad because truly, if you look back at the roster, we had a kid from Stanford, free agent tight end. Our running back, Bobby Christian from Northwestern, free agent running back. We had a little guy from Oregon. I mean, Tom Water was like in his last year. We had no help for Jim, no help. And he did everything he could in that first year. We were seven and five. We were, I'm saying we're on our way, then we lose. We end up seven and nine my first year. And then Jim's contract was up and blah, 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 here we go. But uh, I have a great rapport with Jim, even to this day. I'm a big Michigan fan and supporter of his. Well, his first interview, he wouldn't interview. We were going to do his first game. It was going to be at Utah, Michigan, Utah. That was Jim Harbaugh's first head job at Michigan game. And we wanted to do an interview because Fox was doing the game. And he would not interview with anybody. He says, I'll interview with Coach Wanstead. So I flew to Ann Arbor and we sat down and we had a great, great time together. Do you think he's different as a person now? either from when you saw him on the Bears or when you first did that interview and he was starting at Michigan? Oh, I don't think he's different as a person. I think that a lot has transpired. I think he, you know, I, I, I think originally, you know, he talked to me a lot about how he's getting his hair cut, where Bo got his hair cut and where he was living. And, and he was so much into the Michigan thing. There could have been a little bit of, well, because I was Bo's guy and this is Michigan, that this road could be a little easier. I think maybe he thought it could have been a little bit easier than what it's been. And he's realized now what the adjustments and what he's got to do. You know, now obviously they're playing great. But, uh, you know, I, I mean, I could have seen how that would have happened. It was such a big story that I think everybody, the media, thought that it would Jim would walk in and it would be the house of Bo and Michigan's back to where Michigan was with Bo right yeah when when you look back at uh at your time you you know you mentioned you could have taken the Giants job were there any other job offers you had that you were like yeah maybe I'm, I don't not that you regret taking them but you're like well I could have gone a different path uh Den Denver uh, they wanted me to you know New England I had a I, you know I had few offers but no this was I kind of zeroed in on the Giants and uh and the Bears didn't wasn't there a co I thought there was a college team that was interested in you when you were an NFL coach too oh yeah yeah there, there were I mean uh yeah there were yeah I, I won't say the one but it was I got you I got you it's good to be Dave one set <laughs> I'm here with you I'm happy to be doing this with you Are you kidding me you have this, you really do have this great personality. When you're a head coach, do you feel you have to bring it down that you can't show your entire fun side because yeah, you're a football head? I, I never dreamed I'd be doing any of this media stuff, you know, because I was always so guarded as a head coach, you know, that everything that I said, how would it be? How would the players interpret it? How would the media interpret it? You know, so I mean, it's, right. I, and I probably regret that, you know, but. Now, you know, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, I'm, I just kind of, this is more of my personality, really. Right. Yeah. All right. Uh, you've got a show to do, so I'm not going to take much longer. But before you go, we're going to do before you go. Four questions unrelated to anything. All right. Number one, what was your first car? A 1973 Oldsmobile 88, Delta 88. Spent almost my whole bonus from Green Bay Packers on it. That's how stupid. It was green too. You had a green car. Well, it was. It was. It was light, like a light shade. Yes. Yes, but it was nice. Number two, favorite city in America. Oh, favorite city? I would say probably Chicago. How come? 
just because I, I I love the restaurants, I love action, I like the love the people, I love the the holiday seasons. Nothing like it. Michigan Avenue. Number three, who's your hero? Oh, I don't know if I got a hero. You know, you can say me. I, I could say Mike Hall if I want to make Chicago. I could say Mike Ditka. How's that? You know, <laughs> make Chicago people happy. You know. What was your relationship with him like? Fantastic. I was. I saw him. I, we were together. I went by and saw him in June. You know, he lives in Naples, ten minutes from me, and uh, so I went by and saw him. And uh, he was the big guy in the neighborhood. You know, Mike. We were from. His dad worked in the same steel mill my dad did on the other side of the river. Wow. Mike went to Pitt. I went to Pitt. You know, so I had a relationship with Mike. I was going back and playing in his golf tournaments in Pittsburgh. Uh, when I was coaching in college and he was an assistant for the Cowboys. <laughs> so I, we, Mike, Mike's been great to me. All right. Last one. This doesn't have to be football. It could be an entertainment or politics or anything. Who have you not met in your life that you'd love to meet? Mm. Who have I not met that I'd like to meet? You know what? I would say, um, uh, that's a good question. I would probably, I will we'll keep the sports. I, I'm a lefty and I'm not a very good golfer. I would enjoy playing a round of golf with Phil Mickelson, a big lefty. I could see that. Get some tips from him. Uh, no, he would see my swing once and he, he'd probably want to talk to anything. Yeah. yeah. Other than my golf game. Dave, you have been a joy to work with. And I think to end this podcast, I have one perfect word to summarize it. Bang. Bang. Can't beat Wani. Man, does he have stories, huh? That was a fun glimpse into the world. I get to live working on shows with him. That'll do it for this week's podcast. From the Big Ten Network in Chicago, I'm Mike Hall. We'll see you next week. Thank you